Lord, I pray for those among us who do not know you even now, that as we look to your word, that your spirit would come and bring the increase even as it goes forth and work it into the heart of people. You create worshipers here, Father, people who have been transformed and forgiven by faith in Jesus and renewed, recreated, God. Worshipers of Jesus. And help us who you've been gracious to already. Lord, to be uh, encouraged, to be strengthened, to be convicted where we need to be, Lord. And to find our hope and joy and treasure in Jesus Christ alone. We need your help for all of this. That's why we ask. We come to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We'll be in John chapter 4, verse 27 through 42, to kind of bring us to our text and a review from last week. Last week we looked at verses 16 through 26, and the big takeaway for us was that worship is not tied to a location. Worship is not tied to a location. It's not tied to externals whether it's in Jerusalem or on this mountain or in this building or in this temple, it's tied to a person. Worship is tied to a person, the God-man, Jesus Christ. We looked at verse 24 last week and it taught us that God is spirit. Because God is spirit, that those who worship him, they must worship him in spirit and truth. So we noted that much is being done in the name of worship, but we see here that if it's not in spirit and truth, then it's not worship. Acceptable worship to God, where God determines what is pleasing and acceptable to him. The Samaritan woman thought worship was tied to a place. And beloved, many today will enter into a, a building, many ornate, stained glass, crosses, statues, And they'll gather to profess to worship, claim to have worshipped. But we see here again, it may not be worship at all. And beloved, if we're going to worship God who is spirit, then our spirit must be alive to God. Remember that in Adam, our spirit is dead in sin. It's dead to God. It's dead to the truth of who God is. What can be known about him is suppressed and exchanged for worship of the creation rather than the creator. Our only hope is that the Spirit of God would make us alive spiritually. And then we, being made alive by the Spirit, are spirit. And we can relate to God now who is spirit. If we don't have spiritual life, which comes to the new birth, which we studied in chapter 3, we cannot worship God. Many people are very devoted, very consistent, giving of their time, their money, and their lives in the name of worshiping God, but for the most part, it's not worship. Jesus, quoting of the prophet Isaiah in Matthew 15, verse 8, said, speaking of the Pharisees, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain... Do they worship me? In vain do they worship me. True worship must come from those who have been made spirit, born again by the spirit from above. And then and then only can we worship from the inside, from the heart, as an overflow, as an expression of the revelation of God. One who has, as chapter 1 verse 14 said, one who has beheld his glory. Glory of the only begotten of the Father. So, God isn't just saying people, saving people from the penalty of their sin. We noted last week, God's creating worshipers. God's creating worshipers. But we need to know this, saints. Even we who have been made alive by the Spirit of God, who have gathered today, Lord willing, to worship, can sit here today and still not worship God. Because not only must you be alive and be of spirit to worship God who is spirit, to worship from the heart, but it must be in truth. We must worship God in truth. Truth about who God is as he's revealed himself to us through scripture, his nature, and his character. 
If you worship God on a false pretense, thinking God is something, and you're worshiping this God of something, but it's contrary to the character that God has revealed to us in Scripture, maybe a God who's okay with you sinning. He's fine with that. Not a big deal. So you worship this God who's fine with you sinning, just making that little mistake. And you call it worship, but it's contrary to the revealed nature of God. Then it's not according to truth, and it's not worship at all. It's idolatry. So we worship God in truth based on who God is, and we worship God in truth about how we are to worship God what our worship should be, and what it should look like according to Scripture, where God himself determines what the worship looks like according to Scripture, where God himself is the center and the object of worship, where we the people aren't the center of the worship. Well, we're not gathered anymore to be entertained and we're not gathered to be tickled or have our emotional needs met, but we gather to behold God according to Scripture and respond according to Scripture and worship to Him so that it's pleasing to Him, acceptable worship. And we must worship God in truth about the way God said we are to approach him, namely in Jesus. Meaning, our worship must be Christocentric. If we are only means of getting to God is in or through Christ, then our worship towards God must be Christocentric. It must be in Christ. We come to the Father through the Son. We don't have other mediators. So if it's not according to his true nature or character, if it's not according to the way of worship he's prescribed through Scripture, or if it's not through Jesus Christ as a means to the Father, then all of our worship is in vain. Is in vain. And my prayer in my own heart personally and pastorally for all of us as we gather corporately is that we would always be reforming in our worship. Reforming in the heart, reforming in the spirit, reforming in the truth concerning God and the way he has revealed that we are to worship him. Those who are alive in him behold his glory and respond from the heart, engaged in the mind with praise and worship. Well, today we'll hit verse 27 through 45. So let's turn there and take a look at that. Verse 27 says, Just then, his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with the woman, but no one said, What do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to him, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent to you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed two days, and many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. 
I want to walk through the verses just at a high level and then come back and pull out from them a few things. First in verse 27. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said to him, what do you seek or what are you talking? Why are you talking with her? Why did they marvel? We already discussed. Well, one, it's not customary for men to be talking with women from a society perspective at this time. And two, we have an issue here. She's a Samaritan and Jesus is a Jew. And it is also not customary for Jews to be speaking with the Samaritans. So the disciples just assume he must be needing something from her. That's why he's engaged with her. What does he need from her? Why is he seek, What is he seeking from her? Why is he talking with her? What could this be about? And what we see right away in this, beloved, is Jesus crosses racial barriers, gender barriers, social barriers, cultural barriers, and most importantly, sin barriers. A friend of tax collectors and sinners. Not because he participated in their sin, but because he was seeking out sinners. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And here at the well, Jesus is talking with a non-Jew, a Samaritan, with a woman, not a man, and with a known outward sinner. And I don't know about you, but I rejoice that Jesus Christ came to seek and save sinners. You should rejoice at that as well. Well, the last time we saw that the Samaritan woman, she stated, well, I know that Messiah is coming. And Jesus said to her in verse 26, well, I am he. So we're going to shift from the disciples' perspective for a second and look now at the woman at the well's perspective for a second. So the woman left her water jar, went away into town and said to the people, come, come. See a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town and were coming to him. Now many believe this, the woman at this point is converted. And we can't say for certain. But I think there are things we can look at that are giving evidence of fruit of conversion. And I want to look at a couple of those things that we see that are fruits of conversion. The first thing we see is she left her water jar. So, what's significant about that? We have to ask this question, what did she come to the well for in the first place? She came to get water. Why? Because if you don't come with your watering jug to get water, you can't do your deeds for the day, per se. There's no cleaning without the water. You don't have a spigot here. So imagine if you woke up this morning and you were just going to come and be a part of the worship and, and, and join together as we worship God and you go to the sink and you flip it on and there's, there's no water. Or you go to flush the toilet and there's no water. Or you go to get a drink and make something to eat but there's no water. Or you go to get in the shower to clean yourself but there's no water. What do you notice? Your day is stopping. I need the water. And this woman's coming out to the well to get water. Why? So she can fulfill what she needs to do for the day. Without the water, nothing else gets done. So she has a task she needs to get done, but she has an encounter with Jesus. And after this encounter with Jesus, something has so captured her that she just leaves the water jug and leaves. I think that's significant. I think it's important that John pointed it out. I don't think it's something minor. She left her water jug. She's captivated. Don't we see throughout the gospel accounts a reoccurrence of people that have an encounter with Jesus? and then leave things immediately? I mean, don't we see that like in Matthew chapter 4, verse 22? Immediately they left their boat and their father and they followed him. 
We see people off doing something, fishing, boat, parents here, there, things that are important, part of daily survival, part of daily needs. They have an encounter with Jesus and that they're awestruck. Something happens to them and they just leave it. Why? They've been captivated by something else. Well, not only that, but let me ask you this. What did she leave her jar for? It wasn't that she just left the jar and thought, oh, this is that where I don't have to come to the water anymore. I can just go home and go to bed. She didn't leave her jar to not work. She left her jar to go do what? To go tell others about Jesus. She is so captivated by this man in front of her who she said, Messiah is coming, and he says, well, I am he. She leaves the water jug, and she's got to go find people to tell them about this man, this Messiah. So what do we see in that? We see a love for other people. A love for other people. A concern for the salvation of others. Beloved, that's a mark of conversion. Is your soul burden for lost sinners? Parents, it isn't that we just want our children to grow up to be successful. We don't want them just to do well in school and, and to get a, a good job and it pays well so they can get the American dream. That's not the goal. What's the goal? That they would know Jesus and treasure him and be with him for all eternity and glorify him while they're here on this earth. A concern for their soul. And not only our children, but your family. So many of you are the only one in your entire family line that's saved. And I talk to you and I listen to you and I pray with you. Oh, God, save these people. And what do you do? And we prayed over these last few months when many of us gathered with our lost family that we would go and sit with them and we prayed for open doors and we prayed for boldness and we prayed for the Spirit to come. And do what? Save them. Save them, God. Why? Because a mark of conversion is a concern with the souls of people. Christians want to see people saved, God being glorified in that. She wants people to be saved. Come. Come. And what does she say to them? She says, come. Come. Another thing we see repeated in Scripture where Jesus says to people, well, come and follow me. And where other people, they see Jesus and then they run and get someone. They say, come and see this man. We talked about it in chapter one. Do you remember that in chapter one? When we saw that, that um, Andrew went and got his brother Peter, Simon Peter. We found the Messiah. Concern immediately, go get someone, bring him to him. We saw Philip. He went and got Who? Nathaniel, what did he say to Nathaniel? We found the Messiah, come, come here. And she's calling people not to philosophy. She's not calling people to religion and good works. She's calling people to Jesus. And beloved, this is the message As Christians, we're not calling people to some ethereal truths out there. We're not calling people to, hey, come and be a part of this church group on Sunday morning. We're calling people to Jesus. And listen, if they come to Jesus and by grace repent and believe, they're going to want to be with the people of God. They're going to want to come and worship God. So remember this, when we call people, come, we're calling them to a person, the God-man, Jesus Christ. The way, the truth, and the light. And that's what she does. Come and see the Messiah. What else is she doing? She's giving personal testimony. Leaving the jar, 
That's not important to me anymore. Something else has captivated my heart. Going to lost people, calling them to come to Jesus, and she's telling them her testimony, which is what? Come see this man who told me everything I've done. I think that's significant. You know why? Because of what she's done. She's known for the five husbands. He's told me everything I've done. Let me ask you this. What kind of reception is she going to get from these townspeople, do you think? Here comes the loose woman. Really, we're going to listen to you? Five husbands and the one you're with right now is not your husband? You want to talk to me about spiritual matters? And I love that she couldn't care less. She couldn't care less. Why? Something has captured her heart. I don't care how they respond. I found a man who told me everything that I did. What's she talking about? Her sins. And what does she say? You got to come see this one. You got to come see him. Much for us to learn from. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Now we're going to switch back to disciple perspective again. Verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples are urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Rabbi, eat. So Jesus is engaged in an eternal conversation with this woman. They think he must want something from her, but they're afraid to ask. Instead of asking him, now they turn back to the physical and they say, hey, Jesus, you need to eat. And he did send them away to get food. But the disciples' minds are on the temporal, not the eternal. The temporal here. And, and I see a pattern here. When you look back at Nicodemus, and Jesus says to him, hey, you need to be born again. Jesus is speaking of eternal spiritual realities. Nicodemus' mind is on the temporal, physical. What does he say to Jesus? How do I crawl back in my mother's womb? When Jesus first begins to talk to the woman at the well, he says to her, I have living water, which is eternal life, spiritual eternal realities she's in the physical mind she says give me the water so i have to come back to the well jesus is having an eternal interaction with this woman and the disciples are saying to him hey jesus eat physical food and we keep seeing this pattern jesus thinking of eternal spiritual heavenly things those around him even some who are saved being the disciples distracted by temporal things and how does Jesus respond? Verse 32. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. Okay? Now their mind is still physical, so look what they respond with. The disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Oh, he's got a, a, a little side pouch of food somewhere? No. No. They're still thinking physical. And what does Jesus say to them in verse 34? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. We're going to see this repeatedly again throughout the Gospel of John, but Jesus has a singular purpose and devotion in his life. This is his existence. This is his purpose. This is his identity. And beloved, know this. I want you to know this. This is to be yours as well. Singular in focus. Eyes on a singular reality. Showing us again that Christianity is not something we add to our lives. Knowing and doing the will of God is not something that we just add into one of the circles of my already so busy life. What Jesus is showing us here is the reality of Christianity. 
Jesus' very strength and sustenance, what stirs him, what drives him, what empowers him is to know and do the will of God. It's, it, the will of God is not something he considers on the side when I can fit it into my already busy life. This is his life. This is his life. And we need to look at it and say, well, what is, what is my life? This is his identity. My food is to do the will of the Father and accomplish that. And for us as believers, born again, saved by grace, adopted in, living for eternal realities, are to be, have the same one-minded devotion unto Jesus Christ. You say, what do I do, is quit my job then? Well, no, you don't have to quit your job. But I would say this to you again, that anything that comes between you and this devotion of knowing and doing the Father's will is on the table for the chopping block. Everything. Why? Because this right here, beloved, this is life. It's not like we have life and then sometimes we do this Jesus stuff, this God's will stuff, this advancing the kingdom stuff. This is life. This is the life. If you're religious, you view this as something you do when you can get it in. If you're converted, this is who you are. This is the reality. So it's no longer that I, I go to work and I fit in this Jesus stuff when I can. I go to work for the Father. Everything flows out of this because we've been recreated at the center. Christianity flows from the inside out. It's not something that we go and do. It's who we are. Can I tell you something that encouraged me in this text too? Jesus Christ is my righteousness. Meaning, if you've been born again, your desire is to see God glorified and see his kingdom advance, that he would be glorified in that. That's the desire of the believer's heart. But we struggle in that. We're so distracted, so easily distracted, failing so often in this, right? Right? And the blood of Christ cleanses me from raising up something of more significance than God, which is idolatry. But here's the beauty of the cross as well. Jesus never once wavered from this devotion. There wasn't one second that he gave something greater priority than God's will and it being accomplished. Never once. Now listen, he was tempted by it every single day. And we talked about how his temptation is greater than ours because with temptation, just like lifting weights, we often are tempted to hear and the weight lifting and then we give in and stop. But when you don't give in, you keep pressing forward, the temptations get harder. Jesus tempted in every way that we are, yet listen to this, he never sinned. Never once was it not Jesus' will to do the Father's will. Never once was it not his food to do the Father's will. Can I give you some encouragement right now? That righteousness is applied to you if you're in Christ. Regarding your acceptance before God in right standing, that clothes me, his righteousness. Now if that in any way says to you, that I don't have to worry about it at all. You've missed it entirely. But in every way, if you say, this God, worthy of all devotion, not only saves me, but clothes me in the perfect obedience of Christ, that compels me and encourages me to live more and more to make this God known. Many believe Jesus is thinking of Deuteronomy chapter 8 when he speaks about his food being the will of him who sent him. 
It says, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make known that man does not live by bread alone, but lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Can I encourage you in this too? If you're converted, your great desire is an ever conformity that everything in your life would be done unto the will of God for the glory of God. That's the desire of the true believer. We struggle, and that's the desire of it. Let me tell you this. God the Father is working towards that end in your life here on earth. That's the reality of our right standing in heaven with Jesus Christ. But God the Father is working that reality in your life right now. And he's committed to that. We'll get to that in John chapter 15 in the vine and the vine dresser. So the things in your life that you may be holding on to, the Father is working to remove them, that your total devotion would be unto him. Verse 35. Do you not say that there are yet four months, then the comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. What Jesus is saying is, hey, normally... It takes four months before the harvest. But here, spiritually speaking, in regards to souls, the time is now. The redemption, the redemptive plan of God is being unfolded. And I think contextually when he talks about you are going to reap what you have not labored in, I think the laboring is done by all the prophets of old who foretold of a time when Messiah would come. John the Baptist being the end of that line we saw in chapters 1 and chapter 2. And then here comes Jesus saying, I am he, the time now is here. And these disciples are going to go now and reap what all of these prophets of old have labored in. I think 1 Peter chapter 1, and I didn't put it on here, I put the text on here. Let me just read it to you though. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. See if you agree with me in this. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Listen to this now. It was revealed to them, these prophets who were prophesying about the coming of Christ, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels long to look at. What Jesus is saying is, is this, hey listen, there has been much laboring here. The foretelling of Jesus, of the Messiah to come, has been going on for hundreds of years. John the Baptist being the end of that line. And you now, disciples, and we now here, come out and reap with all the laboring that's been done before us. And those who have labored and those who reap join together and rejoice at what? The conversion and salvation of soul. God being glorified through people repenting and believing. But know this, beloved. It doesn't happen apart from you preaching the gospel. It's amazing that God would allow us to be a part of this. I mean, look at who he's using here in John chapter 4. You may say, well, I'm not an orator. I can't speak well. And I'm not well taught I'm not well learned. I don't have a good reputation. That's why I love that he chooses the woman at the well. 
She's not an order. She's not well learned. She's not even a Jew. She's not a teacher. And she's got a horrible reputation. And God says, I'm going to work through her. I'm going to work through her. Why? Because in that, God gets all the glory. So if you're sitting on the sidelines in this reaping of the harvest where the fields are white saying, couldn't use someone like me, John chapter 4 says, "Uh uh-uh, you don't get that excuse. You're not allowed to say that. Why? Because look who he used. He uses nobody. He uses nobody. And I want to ask you and plead with you, are you going out to this harvest? I talked to you before about, we we talk about praying for open doors. I know we do. But beloved, so many of you speak about that and so many of you pray about that, but you never, ever open your mouths. You never engage. Ever. Maybe one day. It's today. There may not be a tomorrow. There's an urgency here. The harvest is now. We should feel the weight of that. Not that it's we save people, but we are the means through which God has chosen to work through. I'm going to end today, not yet in a little bit, by asking, why don't we do that? I mean, what a privilege. What an honor that God would work through these broken vessels and allow us to be part of this rejoicing when we see people come to Christ and give God the glory. Well, what happens? This woman, captured by something, leaves her jar, runs back to the city. People who don't like her don't think much of her. And she said, I met a man who told me everything I ever did. You got to come see him. Maybe the Messiah here. What happens? Look at verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him. Now I know we talked before that words like believed in him are attributed to people who may not be converted. I understand that. Let's keep reading. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him. Why? This is where I want you to feel the weight of this. Why did they believe in him? Because of the woman's testimony, which was what? He told me all that I ever did. You say, well, what do I tell people? Tell them your testimony. Tell them your testimony. Tell them about who you once were. Tell them about who you are. And tell them about who did it. And tell them, go see this man. It's Jesus. Listen, do you have a testimony? I guess I got to ask that. It's personal here. Do you have a testimony? I'm not saying you have to know the hour or the day. I'm saying, though, that there is, for every true Christian, a reality of newness of life that we can testify to. I once was this. I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Now I am this. All glory be to his name. Go and meet him. Come to him. He is the way. That's the testimony where you were, what your circumstances were. That's exciting to hear too. But do you have a testimony? Even those of you who have been raised in the church and are morally, outwardly pure in a worldly sense, there's an inward transformation when you're converted to Christ. A treasuring of Jesus. Not so he will accept me, but because I've seen that he has accepted me. Do you have a testimony? 
And beloved, look what it says again. Read it with me just so we're reading the same thing. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. It was believable. And I'm not saying you have to be charismatic and, and try to sway people with this charismatic speech. Okay? It's not like you, you have to try to sell this stuff. When you've been converted, you're excited about Jesus. It isn't you calling people to religion. Everyone in the world is calling them to religion. You're calling them to a treasure of Jesus. You're calling them to grace. You're calling them to love. And if you've been converted, it's believable. Isn't it true that the scriptures teach us he who has been forgiven much loves much? As we grow in the revelation of God's grace towards us, don't we grow in love for him and love for others? So they listen to this woman's testimony. And verse 40 says, so when the Samaritans came to him, they saw something in her that was believable. And they said, let's go find this guy. And they came to Jesus and they asked him to stay with him. And he stayed two days. Something to learn there. It's more than handing out a track. I love tracks. I have thousands. I just organized my track box the other day. We need to, tracks are good, but I see a willingness in Jesus here. You want me to stay? I'll stay. Why? Because nothing in the world is more important than this. This is it. You want me to meet with you again? I'll meet with you again. For how long? For however long it takes. A week? Sure. A month? Yep. Five months? I tell Rowdy's testimony a lot for the glory of God, but I don't know if he's still here. I think I met with Rowdy for six or seven months, and I never changed what I told him. We looked at different passages, but it just was, come to Jesus. Here's why. Here's what he did. Here's why you can trust him. Today's the day. Repent and believe. And then God saved him. So it's more than just a transaction. It's something that we're willing to do forever because this is my life. And not just because I'm a pastor. This is every Christian's life. You're to be doing the work of the ministry, right? So let's look at it again. It's verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Verse 41. And many more believed because of his word. So they hear something in us. It's convinced. They're convinced because of the testimony and truth of the testimony. They come to Jesus. They hear the truth of the gospel from him, from the word, from the gospel track maybe, and then they believe. In verse 42, it says, They said to the woman, It's no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. We know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. That sounds like salvation to me. I'm excited about that. I don't know about you, but verse 39 through 42 get me really, really, really excited. But I see two absolute necessities for this reality. Number one, the people of God are going out into the harvest, telling their testimony and calling people to Christ. It doesn't happen without that. And number two, the Spirit of God comes. And we got to be praying about that Spirit of God to come. To come and awaken people. And don't stop laboring. You keep laboring and you keep praying and you trust he'll come when he comes. I love my brothers who go down to the West End and labor and then pray. And labor and then pray. Not just week after week. Not just month after month. Year after year. Why? Why? Because we believe this stuff is true right here. We believe the Spirit of God still does stuff like this. And it's up to Him and His perfect will and His perfect timing, but it's not beginning to be because we didn't share. It's not beginning to be because we didn't go to the harvest and not because we didn't believe and not because we didn't pray, Lord willing. It's because 
He's going to get his people when and where he wants. And we're going to be faithful unto him. I got to believe if we're converted, our heart beats for verses like this. I've sat with many of you and prayed with you about your families, and I listened to you pray for them. God, save my son, save my daughter, save my mom, my brother, save my neighbor, save my coworker. And we want that. I'm encouraged when I hear that. So here's my question that I'm going to end with now. Why aren't we going out like this woman? I think the answer's in the text. Like I read this and I go, God, I want that for my life. I want to be singular and focused. I want to lose the distraction of temporal, earthly things that moth and rust are going to destroy, but I find myself captivated by them at times, not believing, being distracted by them, not going out into the harvest, whether that's in your home or outside your home. What is it, God? I want this to be a reality. Why isn't it more of a reality? So what now? What happened to this woman? You say, well, she was born again. Okay. What happened to you then? If you're born again, but you're so distracted by other things, maybe it's the the jar. Can't leave the jar. Maybe you're so distracted by what these people might think of me when I go to them. Because if anyone had anything to be worried about, I think she had it, didn't she? They knew her. What made her in that moment lose the jar? I don't even care about that. Lose the, how these people are going to receive me. I don't even care about that lose the embarrassment of what the testimony would be. He told me all that I did, all the men. He told me about them all and say, come to Jesus and here's what we know about this. Are you ready to me for this? Tell me the truth. Most of the people in your life around you today, that if you come to them and say, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth of repent and believe, they're going to go, you're such a fool, you've lost it. I mean, God's people through all the ages have always been thought of as just fools, haven't they? You're giving up what? One of our brothers in here was, had this whole path laid out for him in regards to his degrees and what he was going to be and all the money he was going to make by his parents. And Jesus captured his heart. And guess what? He didn't, he didn't care anymore about that stuff. And his mom came and talked to me and said, My son has lost his mind. I said, no, (laughs) he's seen truth. He's seen something greater than a good job and a lot of money and nice cars and big houses. He's seen an eternal glory. He's not a fool. He's alive. So what captured this woman's heart? Think with me for a moment. And please allow me just to go on for a minute more because I think this is the whole key of it all. Because if you're like me, your heart's saying, God, please make this more of a reality. Let me be more faithful in evangelism. Let me be more faithful in prayer. Let me believe more. I want to see the harvest get increased and and I want to see it grow. I want your glory, God. I think you're all like me if you're converted. I'm not special in that. And we say, but what, what, what do we do? And I think this is it. This woman went to get water one day. And a man was there and he approached her. And he started talking to her about some living water, which she didn't understand. And she thought, this sounds pretty, pretty good. 
won't have to come back to the well anymore. She's experiencing a, a kindness from someone, a Jew who shouldn't even be talking to her, a man who shouldn't even be talking to her, but not like the other five men who came to her for the wrong reason, right? They all came for what they could get from her. Selfishly, they came. And the one with her, oh, he's selfish. Believe me, he's selfish. And she's experiencing the kindness of someone that's undeserved. We call that grace. But I'm sure her heart was beating when she starts thinking like this. He's being kind to me. He's not trying to get from me. He's saying he wants to give to me as long as he says I doesn't find out who I am. Everything's going to be okay. Because once he finds out who I am, he's probably going to treat me like everybody else does. And it's after he offers her the living water, she thinks things are going well, and he says to her what? Go get your husband. Put yourself there in her shoes for a moment. I mean, I, I imagine this heart is like, oh no, here it comes again. It's going to be revealed who I am and the same treatment I've got my whole life is going to be coming out again. So maybe I'll just lie to him and try to keep it under the covers. Oh, I don't have a husband. And he says to her, I know you don't. You've had five. And the one you're with right now is not your husband. And surely at that moment she thinks this whole living water deal is over. And she uncomfortably, we saw, turns the conversation. Let's talk religion and get it off of me and maybe I'll escape from this situation. Where should we worship? On this mountain or over here? And then she says after some conversation, I know Messiah's going to come. And he says to her, what? I am he. And I think at this moment, the very thing that we... We need to happen again right now, happen to this woman, which was this. Wait a minute. He offered the living water to me, and he knew who I was. It wasn't, oh, if he finds out it's over, he knew who I was. And he is the Messiah. And he still offered it to me. Beloved, she experienced love for the very first time in her life. It's the very thing we all so desperately crave is love. If I can borrow from the words of a writer here, she found a man who saw her all the way to the bottom of her secret sin-filled life and loved her all the way up to the sky. To be loved and not known is superficial and unsatisfying. They say they love you, but they really don't know you, so they can't love you. To be known and rejected is our greatest fear. Because everyone in this room knows this right now. Even the people you live with really don't know you, do they? They may know you better than I know you, and they may know you better than the people at work know you, but they don't know you. They don't know the things that have gone on in your mind and your heart. 
They don't know the things you've lusted after and chosen over God. They don't know that about you. And the fear that everyone in the world has is if anybody finds out that stuff, I'm going to get rejected. Because no one could love something that dark and dirty and filthy. And this says, oh, there's one that does love those dark, dirty, filthy people. His name is Jesus Christ. To be loved and not known is superficial and unsatisfying. To be known and rejected is our great fear. But to be known and loved is Christ. It's heaven. It's glory. And I think what motivated this woman to go, who cares about the jar? And who cares what these people think about me anymore? And who cares if I get rejected? I've been loved by the love of God in Jesus Christ. It's all I need. It's all I ever wanted. And I found it. And I'm going to make it known to the world. That's what Christianity is. And I think what's missing in true born-again Christians is a greater revelation of that love. You say, I want to go out and evangelize more. Listen, I can stand up here and say, well, what'd you do this week? How much TV did you watch? What'd you do with your time, your money? And I could guilt all of you. I could do it to every single one of you and guilt you all. And I could say, you should be doing this and you should be doing this. And it's true that we should be doing that, but the motivation would be guilt. And it would last about four hours, maybe a day, if I really did a good job. But I don't want that. I want a life that's given to God. And the only way that happens is the growing revelation of God's love for the filthiest of sinners, and it's eternal, and he'll never take it back. And once you realize that, and you grow in the revelation of that, everything else falls to the side. You leave your water jug, you leave the approval of other people, and you go headstrong, and your very food is to see this God glorified. Beloved, this is what it's about, seeing the love of God and being compelled by it. And I think that's what this verse right here means. For the love of Christ controls us, compels us, constrains us, because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all that, here's the purpose, those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. You know what that word compelled means? Constrained. Do you remember when Jesus went to Peter's house and his mother-in-law had a fever? And it said she was constrained by the fever. What was she doing? Do you remember when he got there, what was she doing? She was laying in bed. It consumed her. It took over everything. People were in her house. She's a good hostess. We see it when she's healed. But what happened when the fever got a hold of her? It just, everything was done. She was wiped out. It controlled her. Or what about in Matthew chapter 4 when they bring the sick people filled with diseases to Jesus and he heals them all. You know what it says about those diseases? They were constrained by them. Crippled. Locked up. Life-changing diseases. It's the same word here, but it's attached to the love of God in Jesus Christ. And it says the love of God. When you realize it's not that he doesn't know you, beloved. He knows you better than you know you. He has seen the depths and the end of the wickedness of your heart. And he says, I love you. Why do you love me? Because I love you. And when you come under the revelation of that love, he has seen my worst. And he still wants me. Everything else loses sight because it falls so far beneath it. And that love, when you come under the revelation of it by the Holy Spirit, it constrains you. 
it changes your very life and it begins to direct you and guide you and it exposes everything else as false because it's an all-sufficient eternal love. So what do we need to do? We need to sit before that love and consider it and meditate upon it and pray the Spirit of God would grow us deeper in the revelation of it. And that's exactly what Paul prays for the church at Ephesus in chapter 1 and in chapter 4, that they would grow in the revelation of Jesus Christ, the love of God. Beloved, when your heart's captured by the love of God, it controls you. So yeah, there's work here to be done. What's the work? Sitting before the word, crying out to the spirit of God, show me the love of God that loves me and knowing my deepest, darkest sins. And when you see it, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. That's why there is a war in your life to do that right there. Because when that's closed, you can't see it with the eyes of the heart. And when you don't cry out to God, you don't see it. And then you live by what your physical eyes see, and you're not controlled by the love of God. You will not become more evangelistic by de just determining in yourself or writing it on your calendar for a New Year's resolution. Evangelism grows out of the love of Jesus Christ for lost, filthy, sinful souls and the revelation of it. Let's pray. <clears throat> God. God, we saw before us in this woman a life transformed and changed. I pray in the name of Jesus, God, for your glory that if there are lost people here right now, you would draw them to you. Save them. This love we just spoke of, God, that's this love that demonstrated itself by sending the Son to die in our place. Knowing who we were, God, to be known in the depths of our sin and to be loved, that's genuine love, God, and you've done that in Jesus. Save people here, God. And God, for us who you've already saved, Lord God, we've been so distracted. Lord, it's not going to come through personal determination or self-will. It's going to become by constrained by the love of Jesus Christ. So I pray in the name of Jesus that the Spirit would come through this word and daily as we come to your word to partake and see you and see your love, we would be constrained again and again ever conform to the image of Christ. Finding our very sustenance and doing your will and accomplishing it. Not out of duty, out of joyful delight because of your love. Help us, God. As we sing now about your love, help us, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.